Good morning. A very warm welcome to this service of the Word with renewal of commitment to ministry. It feels strange to be sitting here in my home doing this. No less strange for you sitting in your home. But we come together as the people of God, as we always do at this time, to renew our commitment to God and one another and the church. And so a moment of quiet as we give thanks to God for our ministry. Jesus Christ has made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. Glory and kingship be his for ever and ever. Grace, mercy and peace be with you and also with you. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our sisters and brothers, we do also for you. Give us the will to be the servant of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reigned now and forever. Amen. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for three hundred denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In our reading, Jesus is back in Bethany. It's after the raising of Lazarus, so you can imagine his celebrity status there and the cult following he's attracting. It's just six days before the crucifixion, and he's having dinner with his friend Lazarus and others. Wouldn't you have just loved to have been there at table with them, listening and participating in the conversa conversations? Undoubtedly, he was preparing them, as well as himself, I imagine, for his formal entry into Jerusalem as the Messiah. We'd have celebrated this from our respective places of confinement just yesterday on Palm Sunday. Well, suddenly the conversations are interrupted by Mary. She's the one, remember, who sits at the disciples' feet as they're being apprenticed. I don't know that anyone would have noticed her getting up, but they'd certainly have noticed her coming back and the what happened next. She quietly fetches some nard oil. She goes back to Jesus, she kneels down, and she pours the oil all over his feet. Now, nard was an exotic oil. It comes from the Himalayas, so you can imagine how costly that was. And she doesn't just take a few drops. She takes a pound of nard. She gently massages it into Jesus' feet. 
and then letting down her hair, she wipes his feet with it. It's so intimate that it almost feels intrusive that anyone should be present. In this most tender and beautiful expression of love, the oil is soaked up from one body to the other, and the aroma of love fills the room. Now, usually when we hear of incense and aroma in the Bible, they're associated with priestly offering and sacrifice. Mary would have known this, as I'm sure she'd have known the teaching from Hosea, where God says, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. In this ritual that Mary is performing, she's participating in the death of Jesus. I wonder if she knows that in doing so, she's participating too in his risen life. Mary was a disciple of Jesus. She had listened and watched and prayed and learned from him. She knew that had Jesus been present when her brother was ill, he wouldn't have died. She saw him raise her brother from the grave. Through Jesus' proximity to her, and what we call her teachable spirit, her asking and searching and desire to learn, Mary knew the knowledge of God. She, did she know when she was kneeling at Jesus' feet that she was in fact in the presence of God? At Jesus' trial just a week later, the chief priests will ask Jesus outright, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of God? news that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead had spread, and this was clearly what people were claiming on the streets of Bethany and Jerusalem. Is this what Mary believed? I suspect so. And I suspect it's the knowledge of this and the fear of how this was all going to unfold that brought her to her knees before him. This is a woman before the Messiah, the Son of God giving herself to him. Today, in this not the chrism mass, from our places of isolation, we recall and we shall renew our commitment to God's call upon our lives and the promises we've made to give ourselves to him and to follow and to serve him in the good times and in the challenging times. We are each called in different yet very life-changing ways and each tasked with particular vocation, uh, vocations and responsibilities. Friends, I believe Mary has so much to teach us about Christian vocation. She sets before us an extraordinary model of humility and service. She dares to buck stereotyping. In a room of men, she lets down her hair and exposes herself to rebuke, even though she's about the service of Christ. She prefigures the foot washing by Jesus of his disciples in the upper room. I wonder if Jesus recalled the moment when he's kneeling before his disciples and washing their feet. Mary embraces the drama of the anointing without explanation or commentary. And in no small measure, she pours out the costly oil, which speaks of the immeasurable love of Christ, which he pours upon us, and we in turn are to pour out upon others. One of the immense challenges for each of us in these days of coronavirus is understanding what vocation means when things are unfamiliar. When we can't minister in the tried and tested ways, and when we must distance ourselves from people. Mary draws us back to love, which is the essence of our being, our thinking, our actions are serving. I think it's this that Jesus was driving at when he said, I no longer call you servants, you are my friends. God calls us friends as he calls us to minister to him and through him to the world. And at the heart of calling and service is love. This is exactly what we've been seeing in these present trials. Friends, Bishop Paul and I are so very deeply touched and profoundly humbled by the faithful, creative and imaginative ways colleagues have adapted to the coronavirus uh, crisis 
and how you've endeavoured to support, encourage, pray, lead praise, and provide pastoral care and bereavement support. This is happening in parishes, hospitals, schools, prisons, and very many other workplaces, each in your way and under very challenging circumstances, are pouring out the nard of blessing of your calling. And we want to thank you for this from the bottom of our hearts and for your inspirational ministries. For some colleagues, confinement is something of a gift. It's a time to pray, to read and learn. I encourage you all to make time to attend and to build up your inner life. And as we journey each in our own way through Holy Week to the cross and the empty tomb, may the life and joy of the resurrection touch and bless each of us, making us ready for the new morning and the world beyond isolation. God, fill your heart with love. God, keep you safe and bless you. Amen. Friends, Kate and I welcome you here to Bishop's Lodge where we will engage together in this renewal of our vows as baptised Christians. And then those of us with ministries in the church will commit ourselves again to perform those ministries for the sake of all. If you have printed off an order of service, you can find the responses in there. Uh, or I understand that they will appear at the bottom of this video screen for you to say as appropriate. So this for all of us who are baptised. At your baptism you turned to Christ, repented of your sins and renounced evil. Do you now renew your allegiance to Christ? I do, and with God's grace I will continue to follow him as my Saviour and Lord. Now I'm speaking to those with ministries in the church, my sisters and brothers. At his last supper, our Lord Jesus Christ gave his disciples a new commandment, that they should love one another, and he prayed that they might be one. He gave them an everlasting sign of his own love in the sacrament of bread and wine. He consecrated himself to his Father's service to be the high priest of the new covenant. We invite you now to dedicate yourselves afresh to his service as stewards of the mysteries of God and ministers of his grace. Lay ministers, when you were commissioned, you undertook to be faithful in prayer and by word and example to minister to those for whom Christ died. Will you do all that is in your power to witness to God's love for his people? Those who've been ordained deacon. At your ordination as a deacon, you received the yoke of Christ who came not to be served, but to serve. Will you continue faithfully in this ministry to build up God's people in his truth and serve them in his name? Now for those of you who are priests. At your ordination to the priesthood, you took authority to watch over and care for God's people, to absolve and bless them in his name, to proclaim the gospel of salvation, and to minister the sacraments of the new covenant. Will you continue as faithful stewards of the mysteries of God, preaching the gospel of Christ and ministering his holy sacraments? At your ordination as bishop, you received the gift of the Spirit, that you might lead the church in mission and send out ministers in Christ's name, that you might promote its unity, uphold its discipline and guard its faith, and that you might teach and govern the people committed to your charge. Will you continue faithfully in this ministry, watching over Christ's own flock and building them up in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. By the help of God, I will. May the God of peace sanctify you wholly. 
and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will accomplish it. Amen. Lord, have mercy. My sisters and brothers, pray for all who minister, that they may be constant in prayer and steadfast in faith and serve God's people with joy. Pray for all God's people in their daily life and work, that they may bear effective witness to the good news of Jesus Christ in all that they say and do. Pray for your deacons, that the Lord may pour upon them the riches of his grace. Pray that he who called them to his service may make them worthy of his calling. Pray for your priests. Ask the Lord to bless them with the fullness of his love, that they may be faithful ministers of his word and sacrament and lead his people in the way of salvation. Pray for our bishops, that despite their unworthiness, they may be faithful to the great trust that has been handed to them. Pray that they may become more like our good shepherd and great high priest, the teacher and servant of us all, and so become more and more a sign of Christ's loving presence among us. Pray for the families of those who minister for their homes and for all with whom they share their lives. May the Lord in his love keep us ever close to him and may he bring us all to the fullness of eternal life. Amen. So together with all disciples in this diocese of Liverpool and across the world, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Amen. The Father whose glory fills the heavens, cleanse you by his holiness and send you to proclaim his word. The Son who has ascended to the heights, pour upon you the riches of his grace. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, equip you and strengthen you in your ministry. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, come down upon you all and remain with you always. Amen. As this service draws to a close, May I, on behalf of the Cathedral Chapter, assure you of our continued prayers during this time. Now, go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>